Good morning. I had not heard about this $5 million price that Johan spoke about just a few minutes. And it dawned to me that my talk is actually my entry into this competition. <laughs> I will now tell you what the world both should do, and more importantly, actually could do fairly easily if we decided to do so in order to save the world. To save the world is code for trying to increase the well-being of the majority. It is not code for increasing the well-being of me or the global elite. It is the majority that we're trying to improve. And the UN, in its endless wisdom, has decided that this requires the satisfaction of 17 sustainable development goals with 197 targets. And then Johan comes and he says that not only do we have to address this huge number of different goals, we have to do it within nine planetary boundaries. So nine times 197, that gives like 1,700 things that ordinary idiot voters need to think about <laughs> when they decide to support or not support uh, Miljöpartiet de Gröna. I have worked for this, for sustainable development for 38 years. And I know that this is too complex, as Per Espen said. We need to simplify in order to get the acceleration that Bjorn spoke about. You know, yes, we are doing things, but we are not doing things fast enough. In order to get them done fast enough, we need simpler goals, things that we can manage to communicate to the ordinary people who are the ones that will have to support if we are going to get anything done. So here is my entry. I think that we should, that's the right way, uh, that we should simplify this down to three sustainable development goals, and we should focus all attention on getting those three in place. This will not solve the whole problem, but it will solve 90% of the problem. And we could cut the crap, you know, all the discussion and all the complexifications that, you know, abound in, in this field of climate change and poverty alleviation, etc. So the three uh, goals that I think we should focus, why does it do this? Okay, the three goals that we should focus on is the, are the sustainable development goal number one, no poverty, number 13, climate action, and number uh, sorry, 10, reduced inequality. And I'll take them uh, one by one. On the poverty side, there is, luckily, very rapid development. You know, as nations get richer along the horizontal axis here, the poverty incidence is coming down very regularly in the different uh, regions of the world. And when they get down to the target, which is of the order of 2% uh, incidence of poverty, you know, this will happen within the next doubling or two or three of the, of the uh, income. So yes, there is progress on, on this area. In the Climate area, uh, I put in the Paris limit at one and a half degrees centigrade. And as you see, we are moving systematically up towards this uh, limit. And Johan spoke about, you know, what Anne, as did uh, Bjorn, spoke about the unlikelihood that we are going to be able to slow this increase in the global temperature before we hit uh, the ceiling. Most likely, we will exceed that thing. And the third thing which is important is the sustainable development goal number 10, reduced inequality, and where uh, the Piketty database shows wonderfully how the world is moving in the direction of increased inequity. 
This is the fraction of the national income that accrues to the richest 10% of the population. And that should not exceed 40% in order to have relatively social uh, stability over time. And you see that all regions, according to the Piketty World Inequality Report, are above uh, the 40%. You see very interesting things like the Chinese inequality developing very rapidly after Deng reformed that opening up, but interestingly stabilizing over the last uh, decade as the management in China has started to address the issue of inequity. So in sum, these are the three things I think we should focus on. Uh, poverty, climate, and inequity. And so this means that the marching order is uh, actually quite uh, simple. It is the need to eradicate poverty. It is uh, starting in the south, but also you know, uh, uh, making sure that we do save the remaining, solve the remaining poverty problems in the rich. And then it is to stop the global warming, which is essentially the same as stopping emissions from CO, of CO2 from coal, oil, and gas, and it is the need to reduce uh, poverty uh, inequality in order to ensure uh, social uh, sustainability. Uh, luckily, there are, um, and this is at the ambition level, which I think one could sell to the audience. You know, three things needs to be done. If you, uh, and then luckily, there exist three solutions, one for each of those that are also simple, that can be uh, sold, I hope. First of all, on removing poverty, there is only one nation on the surface of the earth that has actually done a great job in removing poverty, large scale, in a short period of time, and that is China. China has 1.5 billion people. They have 16 doubled the income per person since they started the reform and opening up. They are the show, the only show in town that shows that this can be done. Everywhere else, we have tried using the Washington consensus to do the same type of thing. We have not succeeded. So the solution would be to use the Chinese development model in the poor nations of the world instead of this proven failure, you know, the Washington model pushed by the World Bank and the rest of us. Uh, the second uh, thing on climate action, you know, the very simple thing, very understandable thing to do is to stop investing in new capacity based on coal, oil or gas. Since 70% of the climate emissions arise from the burning of coal, oil, and gas, the only way to get rid of the emissions is to phase out the, the, the use of coal, oil, and gas. And the only orderly way of doing this that could gain support in, in society would be to stop building new coal-based electricity plants, new gas-based electricity plants, producing new fossil cars, etc., etc. So stop investing in new capacity that relies on fossil uh, and, uh, fuels. And the third thing on uh, inequity. There is, of course, a very simple way of solving the inequity, the distributional question in any society, and that is to tax the rich and use the money to pay for collective solutions for the majority. The good thing about this is that in an educated society consisting of wise voters, you know, clearly there would be a democratic majority for taxing the 10% richest. There should actually be 90% of the population if they had a brain. You know, that would be in favor of taxing the 10% using the money to increase the well-being of the majority. Unbelievably, I live in a country where Less than 50% understand this point. <laughs> uh, 
what, uh, since uh, Perezman has all, he, the reason why he does, doesn't like that much to work with me is that I'm so negative all the time. And so I have to really try to be concrete and practical and positive. And so the question is, so what would this mean in Norway? You know, if we were to really focus the attention on those three most crucial uh, sustainable development goals. Well, it is simple. Uh, number one, zero poverty. We essentially have solved that problem in this country. There are tiny pockets, from a global point of view, where there is residual uh, poverty, but largely one must accept that this has been done, and in many ways we should export that solution, just like the Haga lady said, you know, that one of the major roles of Scandinavia is actually to export solutions that we have shown actually work, just like China ought to know sell its solution. By the way, for those of you who are macroeconomists, the most likely reason why China has managed to do what they did over the last 30 years, 40 years, is that they have made credit available for activity that they want. So if they want a highway somewhere, they just establish a bank for lending money to highway construction, and they lend the money irrespective of whether that project is profitable or not. That's the way in which you build a future society, because the money is, of course, printed by the Chinese central bank, basically, so it doesn't matter. And the only thing which bothers Western economists is that there then sits a debt you know, to the government. But this is, of course, the right hand owing money to the left hand. Those of you who understood what I said learned something now. <laughs> most of you did not understand. I accept this. And most economists among you may think I'm wrong. I am not wrong on that one. <laughs> Uh, on the second point, uh, of course, Norway lives well from exporting oil and gas, which, when burnt abroad, emits exactly 10 times as much CO2 as we emit in Norway. We emit 500 million tons of CO2 abroad and 55 million tons of CO2 in Norway. Contrary to the Swedes, we emit exactly as much CO2 today as when I handed in Lavutslipsutvalget's report 12 years ago. We have been speaking endlessly and done absolutely nothing in this country. But that's what we ought to have done is, of course, to close down our exports of oil and gas. That would have been the real Norwegian contribution to a sane future. This is, of course, politically totally impossible. So I skipped that. I just mentioned it, that I'm for an orderly dismantling of the oil and gas sector in Norway, which means replacing, you know, moving those 200,000 people who currently work in the production of oil and gas into sectors where we really need the manpower. We need it in health, we need it in old care, we need it in services, in culture, in education. You know, we need a lot of hands in those sectors. That will increase the well-being of future Norway. What, is, what sells well here, since we have the optimists here, the DNV, GL, and Per Espen, is to talk about the innovation that we could do in this country, and this also Arna likes a lot. You know, this is the green shift. And so, yes, there are a few things that this country could do on that side. And that is to use some of our abundant finance and the brains that some of us have, uh, you know, in order to develop those few things that really are needed internationally. So electric mobility, you know, since we don't produce cars, we can at least have a purchasing support subsidy system that makes this a great market for foreigners. 
Carbon capture and storage, which as Johan said, is going to be one of the core technologies of the future. And when Arna is trying to save 150 million kroner in state's budget by not furthering the CCS uh, project in this country, it is like shooting herself even in her big feet, you know. <laughs> so that's uh, sad. Uh, and then the final thing that we clearly have competence and capability to evolve is deep offshore wind, which is one of the sectors where we both have the resources, the intelligence, the experience from the offshore activity. So these are uh, the two things. And then on the third thing, reduced inequality. We are again in the same situation. We are the least unequal, uh, unequal society on the surface of the earth. So basically we could say that we have solved the problem and we should export the solution. In my book, we should further solidify the, the solution. But that means, of course, doing all those things that people don't want. Namely, increasing inheritance taxes, increase the wealth tax, you know, further accelerate you know, this deepness of the progressive tax, income taxation, et cetera, et cetera. It means trying to take even more from us rich and use it in order to develop you know, something, the well-being of the majority. This is, again, not politically feasible, so I just mentioned it in parentheses. I think we should rather just sell the Nordic model the way we have managed to evolve it into the relatively unequal, the, the relatively egalitarian society of the West. That's it.